some point, he sort of lost the straight edge. Frank Lloyd Wright had it in his spot. <laughs> <laughs> he, he went to a, you know, a protractor, and uh, everything after that was round, one way or another. And uh, I think that, if I had to guess, that was an uh, outcome of Sid's uh, early psychedelic experiences. It'll curve you up every time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. It wrinkled me up quite a bit. <laughs> but I, it was interesting that I, I had a reasonably successful woodworking career after, um, really after the bus. I tried to take a lot of cabinetry on the bus, and I basically they turned over. Roger hired a, a really good cabinet maker. That he had worked with in Hawaii, and, and then he handed me to him and said, "Teach this idiot to do something." And it, it, we had a lot of work to do, so I had to do a lot of work. It came out of it as a fine woodworker. And uh, but everything that I've done since then is straight. There, there are no rounded. Uh, the edges are rounded, but the shapes are all straight. <laughs> do, you, do you think his being also so into music as he was? I mean, I sometimes think of you know jazz and everything that his music, his building is kind of like jazz. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's certainly sort of a connection there. That, you know, rhythm it, it was really something to him. So rhythm and uh, ripples of water, things like that, were inspiration for him. I know, I've, you know, thought about that. He's, he's talked about that. Um, he also was into um, um, what's the in the early 20th century they had um, guys who did the lamps and all of that. Oh, Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau. Right. Like a lot of it was came out of Art Nouveau ideas. Um, and I, but basically, I think Roger wanted to do something different. Time was the Japanese architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at that early on, there wasn't a lot of curly view stuff that came along later. But there was all this Japanese stuff you look at, like I showed you right in the house. Rounded edges, but but rectangular shapes. And things in with space. Windows. Or like the circle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so I think that little room is a, a, a really captures what he was about. Remodels he did in Mill Valley and things were like that. They had an oriental tone to them. They were fairly linear. But I think after we got into the 70s and so on, it became a lot more. Frank Lloyd Wright was trying to express, really, I think, some, I don't want to say sexual ideas, but. Sensual, sensual. Sen sens certainly sensual, yeah, and um, and sexual, but <laughs> yeah, extending uh, over the entire range. <laughs> but he was very. He, he was always, if you would ask him, you know, what what's that supposed to be? He'd tell you in no uncertain terms. <laughs> okay, and now I've got one follow-up to that. So for me, as also having been a person who did a lot of building, did he listen to music often when he worked or did he not? To me, that's kind of a dividing line. There's the kind of carpenter who wants to have a music going in the background. And I have heard one story where he enjoyed listening to music on a project, but... You know, uh, he, he did listen to jazz music fair amount and I I'm, so I'm and I'm trying to think back but I'm sure I, I remember him you know having jazz on mm -hmm. while well, he was pounding the some jazz nails. music thing is, is sort of you know reflected in his work style and all of that improvisation yeah Pardon? improvisation improv yeah I mean, it's sort improvisation. of a, yeah. Yeah. a weird key yeah the, the, the story is them and, working and certainly music you know he was he was much better musician than 
he really let on or people oh, got yeah. to see uh, you know he, he had a, a full classical background and piano and oboe and uh, played the drums and, and then he put, took up the saxophone later but it's just an interesting sideline but he, he went into the army in World War II to to uh, kill Japs how he explained it to me and uh, he ended up working in the uh, in the USO band in Chicago, where he was with you know people like Jerry Mulligan and, and you know uh, famous fairly serious jazz people, musicians. serious wow. musicians that came out of the 40s, and um, and that I think was a profoundly influential experience for him, even though apparently he said he, he drank his teeth out of his head during that phase. <laughs> Is that oh, how the jazz the musicians got got to uh, Druid Heights, the Dizzy Gillespie and Sonny Rollins, and they were there when you were there? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dizzy Gillespie came out. A few, I remember him there a few times playing. What was more, and it, you know, there were various. Uh, John Handy, do you, do you, John yeah. Handy was a very close friend of Rogers. And was Barbara, Dizzy Barbara Gillespie's said Mingus was really out there. Really probably, yeah, probably, and. Um, so there were, you know, Carlos Santana too. And, oh, that's uh, a new one. And some of the, like the drummers <laughs> from Santana and stuff were right. hanging out there before there was such a thing as Santana. Because he was, the real music scene that went on with him out there was the drumming. There were a lot of really great drummers that would come out there and play all night long. Tonga drums. <laughs> And they danced. And, and, yeah, <laughs> they, they all danced. I danced. I was just a kid, so <laughs> they didn't pay much attention to me. But uh, yeah, they were. And, and uh, we had one neighbor who was very kind of psychotic, paranoid um, guy who lived down the down the hill, and he used to regularly call the cops. And of course, they'd start the sirens when they came in the the top of the road. So there was obviously nobody left. When yeah. <laughs> Everybody's hiding in the woods. Huh? Yeah. Well, we must them. be going. They knew who they were dealing with. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, and they we're stopped. Coming. They, they stopped coming. They Was it a, a common thing for famous artists to go come into San Francisco to play the jazz clubs, uh, and then on on their day off to come out to to the mountain or? Uh, I think there was some of that, and not so much whether they would come out to play or not, but, you know, John Handy would bring people out to just see the scene and what it was. And would they stay Roger overnight? Give them on the, uh, you know, I don't know. What do you think? I, I think... Well, if they're playing all night, I mean... <laughs> well, if they, if they, if they, Good if point. they played, they probably crashed, you know, yeah. but, but I, I think... There were always a lot of people that came out and sort of did the tour of, all, of everything. And Roger would give his spiel, and uh, I have to say, you know, in, in in some ways that was annoying as a child because Roger spent a lot more pe time with strangers than he spent with me mm -hmm. at, at any one time. You know, he, he was very outgoing and not, very extroverted. And kind of took his family for granted as being. Because I mean, you know, how many how many times did you hear him tell the same story? Right. You know. <laughs> oh, did the to a new group of tourists? To a new group of people, group, and it could yeah. be anybody that doesn't. It didn't have to be a, a musician. It could just be anybody that came up the road and was interested. Well, I think that was Daniel Ellsberg one time. You know, huh? supposedly really? Daniel came up there and he was looking for Gary Snyder, and Gary Snyder had left. Um, he wanted to tell Gary, "You were right. They had met." many years before and Gary had given his opinions on the U.S. military involvements and things and uh, and they'd met in Kyoto and uh, Daniel had been I don't know wasn't he employee of the Rand Corporation or whatever I mean he did not agree with them but by this point and I don't know if this is pre or post Pentagon Papers but it's still quite a bit later he came looking for Gary I assume he got the info from Gary's listing in Who's Who in America, which listed him in 1969 as one Camino del Canyon road. And so he came looking for Gary, but Gary had left to his new place up in the Sierras. And, and Ellsberg has said, 
Well, I talked to this really nice talkative guy, you know, <laughs> hung out and drunk tea with them and stuff. He and his and his wife and uh, sat, I was going, that sounds well. Let's see who had been there. Doesn't sound so much like Ed. It sounds more like, you know, it sounds like Roger to me. So anyway, another one of the tourists. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I remember I was working at the Mill Valley Lumberyard at one point and Daniel Ellsberg came in and bought some lumber and I was doing truck deliveries, so I delivered this load of lumber to his home. Uh -huh. Right. And he was like, he, he tried to give me a tip and I was like, no way. Thank you. Yeah, just <laughs> we, we owe you. We owe you, yeah. <laughs> so I think that yeah that's right, that. he lived in Mill Valley for a number of years. You mentioned yeah. a crazy guy who lived down the hill and I thought you were talking about Art Aganovich. Oh, Art, not, not Art, it was Art's father. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Art, Art, Art was wonderful. Yeah, his yeah. father uh, was very paranoid. So, uh, been through World War II, and so there's justification. Yeah. But he, he wasn't, uh, he didn't like all this stuff that was going on. It was, uh, I can only imagine my father, who was a World War II vet, with all our entire generation. Yeah. Well, you can imagine someone who's living out there. They're living out there for a reason. They're all. not there to hear the conga drums at two in the morning. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> the jazz scene. Fair, fair <laughs> That's uh, supposed to be in the city. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think it was when, when he first moved out there, uh, he, where they worked together on the road and things, and it was, he was being, you know, kind of taking Roger under his wing. And then, Something happened that soured that. Probably found out he was having an affair with Elsa or something. <laughs> that probably really twisted the thing up. So I'm making this into a long answer to a simple question. Well, that's good. That was kind of the goal. <laughs> Another one. You, okay. Are you, you saying Roger had an affair with Elsa Gidlow? Oh, no, no. I just uh, <laughs> let something out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's, that's, that's Somebody's concerned. camera just dropped on the floor. Oh, oh. that's my camera. So, yeah, I, w I won't elaborate on that. So James Brown lot, wasn't but, lying? But, but, uh, you said that you got tired of hearing the same stories all the time. Reference. Is there one story you heard more than any other that you could bullshit. recite? I did too. Remember? Yeah. yeah. I've heard it too many times. Okay. Well, a little more flexible than I thought. I can't remember anything okay. from that era. You've experienced it. You can't blame me, can you? No, no. Good for um, but no, no you know, I, I it just, was usually interesting. stories about the, what the work thing was about. That he was doing some... Oh, projects. He's, yeah, he's you know, speaking no, to it. where the inspiration was from. And, you know, he explained to them which sex organ this was. Yeah. <laughs> how he got this idea or that yeah. idea from it. Um, I don't think they were so much historical stories. <laughs> Can I ask Anne, what, what did you what did you think well, what impression did you get on how they all thought of themselves? Did they did they think of themselves as being connected to the world in some demonstrative way or were they did they think of themselves as isolated, or how did they, I mean? Today we look, we look on them with great reverence, and we think what they were doing was wonderful, and they become famous. In that day, they many of them were. Um, but do you had do you looking back? Do you have a sense of how they thought about themselves? Well, I think in many ways they were very they related to the world um, through their professions, all of them. But I think they were really into building community. They, they, they had a strong calling to be a community. And uh, I think Roger and Elsa started hatching that plan long before they got to Druid Heights. And um, yeah, and um, you know, and they both came to Alan's lectures and all of that. And then at some point they really invited him to be a come up a part of that community and I don't 
I don't really, I didn't know Ed and Marilyn that well, so I'm not as familiar with how that, how they became involved in, in the community. But definitely, the, I think that for me, it's, it's the word that stands out is saying, mm -hmm. creating community. And for my dad, you know, he, he loved, um, he loved playing, you know, like, I think with Elsa, there's a, a lot of um, sort of British <coughs> cultural background that they shared. She's from Canada, he's from England, but there were certain things that were common to them. And I think, um, and, I, and, and I think, you know, they all had a lot of respect for each other's intellect. They were all brilliant people. And, um, but I think for my dad, he loved to play and Roger played. You know, and, and so that was, uh, my dad had never played, really, really, until he, he met Roger. Because he's such a <laughs> devoted student. Well, he's he was studying. a workaholic. I mean, he yeah. worked and worked. He, um, he had a photographic memory, and he would read and just remember everything that he read. And then, you know, he'd be up at 4 o'clock in the morning writing. But the way they met was that they just attended his lectures, or he, or they listened to KPFA, or they, what? They, well, they came to his lectures for sure. I think Roger came to the academy when my dad was dean of the academy. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. No. Elsa and Roger. That's where they met. Was it, it from from at the academy, right. and then right. they met more seriously at a picnic, KPFA benefit picnic, mm -hmm. in 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 Berkeley, where. Yeah. Supposedly, Roger and some young boy were there. I don't know what young boy would have been with him, but but uh, oh. young boy, and they were scantily clad too. Boy, and was, uh, wait, that was his <laughs> son. Hey, that wasn't me. Yes, Roger. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, his, Roger's <laughs> son. That's right. He only had one son too, I think. <laughs> well, they didn't. We didn't have much money. I probably didn't have a lot of clothes. Didn't have a lot of clothes. Hot like today. <laughs> Did Elsa and Roger become friends before her McCarthyism uh, trial? No. No, way after. Way after. Okay. Yeah. Was that part of the influence, though, that spurred her to leave that area and then move to, and create Drew Heights, do you think? Well, it was a number of things because she wanted to get farther out. You know, she had, in Fairfax, there were neighbors on either side like and, a city lot and up and very that close mountain i mean you know up the hill and she wanted privacy and she didn't have it there and particularly after huac they you know she became well known so and the other thing was she lived with a colored woman and so you know it was easy to identify her so she wanted to move farther into the country. Yeah. And it was really, really Roger. to find them to, to navigate that road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she had been considering buying land in Lake County, I think. Which really. really <laughs> and that would have really bad. been out there. So. But it was through Roger that she was able. Right. Roger and Mary, that she was able to find right. Druid Heights. Well, Roger, I don't know if, Roger so, pitched so it pretty hard. That, that Elsa brought the property to Roger's attention. Yes. She, was it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. She knew, she found out about it and they happened to meet at a, some party. Or something. Yeah, the KPFA picnic. Yeah, the, the picnic. The KPFA yep. picnic. And, yep. and yeah. um, they were looking for something to, like that. Well, you were living right over the hill in Strawberry here we, then, we right? We lived in the house that's, it, it, yes, it was on Strawberry Point, actually on the point at that time. Mm. It's an old Victorian house with no, no electricity. Wow. Um, and uh, they eventually took it down and moved it to the other side. Oh, you lived in the Dickey house? The that's the, that's, that's the, the Audubon. Victorian. Yeah. The big the Victorian. Oh, oh, wow. That's amazing. That's a beautiful home. That's an amazing place. Three, something and I remember I had a, yeah. a real cool. sort of experience with that they we used to there was a little beach there on the in front of the house and uh, I, there was a, on it there was a, 
a old broken down rowboat, like really old fashioned type of boat that had like the wheels on it, which you could roll in it. Mm -hmm. And but it was all decayed. And my mother would get us and sit my sister and I in this thing and read us stories. Oh, mm. And um, one day I came back and the whole beach was completely covered with mud because they had dredged the channel there. And it all smelled, you know, like uh, yeah. Yeah. pretty bad. Pretty so bad. This whole <laughs> idyllic beach and everything just gone in one day. It, was, it just shocked me. It's and very not beautiful after we, today. Not long after yeah. we ended up, you know, we moved to the Heights Heights, because that place was no longer. <coughs> that, well, the house has been has been beautiful. Oh yeah, still oh, the house was moved. And yeah, they put it on a barge and moved it to the were, Audubon. Oh, it's just next thing they were doing was moving that house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it never had electricity, huh? You, they, you all the time you were there, it didn't have. I don't think it, it had, had never been wired. I remember there's, yeah, there's candlelight. And then, there, but there, because of being around there, there was a goat farm there. Yeah. Yes. And and uh, we had the goat's milk from the from from the goats, obviously. And uh, but after we moved out to um, the canyon, the guy who ran that place would hike over the mountain once a week to bring us the goat's milk. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I, I was, so I was raised on goat's milk until I was about five or something. Which probably is, explains a lot of things about my personality. <laughs> but, but yeah, that was pretty important. And then we also had goats and we had goats and I had a little So goat. there were really goats in the goat house? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 the goat's house, yeah. It, it had been well cleaned before we you said, moved in. You know, errant Englishman that showed up <laughs> said, go to the goat house. No, there were goats. She, she had a fleet of them. I mean, there was always yeah. four or five goats. And, stuff. and I had one a little small one that I had posted up on the, when I was really little. And, uh, yeah, they had, they uh, have to tell this story now. They... One day I came back and the goat was gone, and uh, it turned out the real reason was that that he was getting bigger and he and I were playing headbutting games and stuff. And, and my mother didn't think that that was very safe, so they, they gave the goat back to the goat guy, you know, who had him for lunch or something. But, but my f my brilliant father told me that that the goat had had gotten into a can of red paint and eaten the red paint and died. Oh. Hmm. So like, oh. to give you like, what, where would you come up with that story? <laughs> yeah, like, really imagining so. the goat with the little goat with the you know, oh. red beard and everything. And that's oh, five, yeah. you know, it's like, this Roger. was like, you know, and really, and I'm like, you know, how could you let him get into your stupid paint? You know, so <laughs> it was Roger's fault. <laughs> you left the paint open, Dad. What the, no, what's the matter with <laughs> you? Yeah, we never, we were never Bad straight story. after that. <laughs> you let the goat go. Oh, man. Well, now I'm going to get, this is a combined Tagore and David Wills question. I understand there was and David, I'm going to be driving this at you. The field of Druid Heights, where two valiant knights <laughs> clashed, <laughs> clashed so upon the fields there in front of, in front of and, and numerous onlookers. Oh, yeah, it's vaguely coming back to me. Yes, yeah. yes. Including it's, Elsa, wasn't she watching? I think that's yeah, right. yeah. The idea was that we made a lot of noise doing that. Oh, yeah, we were making too much hitting, noise. Um, Trash can lids, that's what it was. Yes. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you, I'm vaguely remembering that now. But. Yes. And out on that... It wasn't a regular thing. It, it was wasn't a, a regular off. joust. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah, we, we had some other jousting that went yes. on, but we won't go into that. <laughs> okay. Now, out in there was Why the not? treeless... Oh, no, no, we went there already. <laughs> Just so you know, I so married his funny. girlfriend. <laughs> okay. So that I could stay in the country and get a uh, green card. Oh, okay. I gave her two hundred and fifty dollars, and that's what enabled partly what enabled yeah. her to I won't tell go to Trump. London. I won't tell Trump. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you're yes. still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm still Glenn. a green card well, alien. He's got the right color skin. He gets away with it. Yeah, yep. there that's you what go. The at the, uh, yep. Yeah, at yep. the office. At the yeah, my attorney said, he said, you won't have any problem, you're white. 
Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah. Uh, yep. You have a good question over here. Yeah. Um, Michael, you you mentioned it, and I think you wrote about it. Was the um, friend of Elsa's that was the professor of Celtic the uh, mythology? Ella Young. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Has she ever lived out there? Ella did not live out there. She was <clears throat> when Elsa moved to Druid Heights, she was, Ella Young was within two years of dying. So she was born like in 1867, I believe, in Ireland, and died in 1956. So she was very old, and... Um, she lived down at Oceano, didn't she? She or lived Oceano? in Oceano. In San, San Luis Obispo area. A very amazing house. And Elsa met her in 1932 at the 80th birthday party of uh, Charles Erskine Wood. Stop. Pardon? Charles Erskine Wood. And... Um, Sarah Bardfield. And he was a, Erskine Wood was a poet, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, it, so it was a party, and I guess Elsa was what? She would have been about 33, 34, and apparently she had heard about this amazing Irish mystic, and someone pointed her out at the party and Elsa quickly saw that there was going to be a spot next to her at the table and she ran out and made a garland and came and sat next to Ella Young and placed it on her head. Uh -huh. And so they had a friendship, of course, until Ella died. And Ella did know about Druid Heights. Um, but she ne probably never visited. Though. She never visited, no. But Elsa and uh, Isabel Qualo went down several times and visited Ella in Oceano. So. Yeah, she was an amazing... So was she the one that kind of informed um, Elsa, I mean, the name Druid Heights, and, and then Elsa, I, I remember you telling the story of Elsa with her Yule Log. Yes. And uh, so where did, where did she learn all of those things? Was that from Ella? Well, so Elsa when she was young, and I mean like a small child, she had, in Canada, she had seen this being in the brook that was close to their house. And, she, you know, she grew up with a lot of brothers and sisters, and she was older, so she had to take care of them a lot. So they were poor. And there was a sense of wanting to get away from this oppressive family life. And she started going to this brook. And she saw this being which, you know, today you might say was a goddess figure, right? Or at least a nature spirit or something. So Elsa had this earth-based spirituality her whole life and Ella Young was totally into fairies mm -hmm. and actually traveled around the US lecturing on the fairy people um, and she was a mystic she was apparently just this magnificent storyteller and I believe from the things that I've read that she helped give form to Elsa's um, spirituality. And her spirituality was really eclectic. 
she, you know, she really related to Taoism and Confucianism and um, she was an organic gardener and so it, it all, I believe, came together and that, yes, I think the Druid part was an influence of Ella and those magnificent uh, oak trees. I think that the trees. The eucalyptus trees? No, the oaks. Oak yeah. That are more back, or back away. They're like her house looking out from oh, the living there, room. There's... All around there, there are the... oak trees. Um, so that's where it came from. Where did she get the money to buy the real estate? I yeah. started to bring that up. Um, does anyone know who Dorothy Erskine is? Dorothy and her husband Morris lived in, um, what is that area there around Grace Cathedral. Is that Pacific Heights? No, Knob Hill. Knob Hill. Knob Hill. Knob Hill. Knob Hill. Knob Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they live somewhere up there. And when Elsa came to San Francisco in 25, 26, she started meeting a lot of very wealthy people. Dorothy being one of them. Dorothy and, and Morris. And I, I can't remember now who it was that introduced her. But they became friends, and she would socialize with a group of people up there. Um, Dorothy went on to be uh, become someone that was uh, very instrumental in the green areas in San Francisco. That family, but particularly Dorothy, and. Elsa didn't have the money to buy Druid Heights. She borrowed it, the down payment, from Dorothy. And that's the way they managed to secure the property. And no bank would loan to a single woman no, then. That she couldn't get the, bank, the money otherwise. Yeah. I mean, by what other means. But, a you know, private loan. Being who she was, she paid back every penny to Dorothy. And, and she also, didn't she use her own money later to help others buy, I mean, she would basically yes. with private loan money. Yes, she to, did. She did you know, private loans. Yeah, to later yeah. in her life when she had, as an investment, Because she was very basically. committed, particularly <laughs> to women to being able to do things that weren't available to women back then. So she played it forward. Yeah. She played it forward. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. All the way through. But you should look up Dorothy Erskine. She's yeah. an amazing woman. She, I, I believe she that she. Yeah, yeah, and she, I think she's the one that either started or was involved with Save the Redwoods. Mm. Mm. That, she. It's not that's, right. That sounds kind of yeah. I never knew that before, but yeah. now that name sounds kind yeah. of familiar. Yeah, no, she was an environmentalist. Uh huh. Yeah, and I think she died like in 88, 90, something like that. So, hmm. so she probably saw what it became through her heights. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, so she, Absolutely. she definitely was out there. She did, yeah. yeah. She did Elsa live in Yorkshire ever? Um, she, was she was born in Hull, which is yes. in Yorkshire. Yes. And they moved to Montreal in, I want to say 1904, so she they came across on the SS Manitoba. She would have been about six in 1904. Yes, she then. was about six. Yes. So she could have had a slight Yorkshire accent, is that possible? She definitely had <laughs> yeah, a I slight so. British yeah. accent. And she... You know, she had a very British 
um, got signed. She, that was, you know, very reserved. And I think it's because she was brought up with two Brits for parents, you know, and even though she was in a, a French environment uh, in Quebec, I think that was really what molded her. And definitely, I think Alan talked about the whole British connection. Right. I right. know I heard Elsa say it. I was just thinking it's one of the ways in which she really and she related yeah because she understood his natural introversion you know uh -huh. like he certainly had a lot of that yeah um, especially when they first met and uh, so that was a place in which they could really relate to each other yes yeah. and the weirdest thing I, mean, I know you know but the weirdest thing was her partner Isabel Qualo, the colored woman, had been in Alan's mother's classroom. It was her teacher because <laughs> Isabel's father was British and was an explorer in Africa. And uh, the mother was actually from Jamaica but was in, um, I think, Congo somewhere like that so that to me was always the strangest <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> only in Britain okay. so okay. strange and Isabel was such a lady she was, there was a classiness about her she was beautiful mm. and very classy <coughs> well yeah. That really comes, to me, that really came through in a picture that everyone will, I think, get to see at some point, where Elsa is appearing her, uh, this is one of the first people to ever be on videotape. This is in the archive in San Francisco, the photograph with Elsa watching Elsa on TV. She's a very, very sharply dressed. She has a hat on. Yeah. It's the mid-1950s. Yeah. The television is in the background and Elsa's on television. It's yeah. amazing. That's an amazing yeah, photo, wild. really, amazing. And, and yeah. yeah, and videotape had just been invented. It was not film record. Right. I do want to say this about Isabel, and I'm so curious about her voice. But um, so, I have a producer for the film in New York, and he's able to trace down anybody, <laughs> and. We discovered that Isabel's great granddaughter lives outside of Manhattan. I know, isn't that? Yeah. And so we, I have talked to her name, Sydney, mm. about Isabel because she was 20 years old when Isabel died. Oh, wow. So she so really she knew yeah. Isabel. And the way she talks about her also, um, I believe you said it, that she was a very warm human being. Yeah. yeah. And also just carried herself with a certain uh, style. Uh, I mean, you say, you know, very elegant, the way she just, and her presence in the room. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just right there, you know, that very erect. Yeah. You mentioned Save the Redwoods. During the time that uh, I'm, my timeline isn't perfect, but I believe that during the time that one of you was there, um, there was another canyon less than a mile toward the ocean from Muir Woods called Frank's Valley, actually, yeah. or Frank's Valley Canyon, that was logged severely that had majestic redwoods first growth redwoods logged while you were there is that is do you remember do you remember the, the, your group being involved in that in any way 
Um, I mean, I think Frank's Valley, that whole valley is Frank's Valley. Well, there's a, yeah, si it was a, a side canyon. As you drive down you. Frank's yeah. Valley Road, there's a side canyon that came in, and that's where the, I kind of remember, I want to say that was late 60s, early 70s, and it was awfully I was late. pretty aware of environmental stuff. I seem to remember myself even then being kind of aware of it was a controversy, and that is now inside Mount Tamalpais State Park. That's correct, I believe yeah. that that was part of the motivation to put it in the park was so, you know, to preserve that whole area there, basically, even though there had been a lot of destruction there, that it would come back and, you know. But none of the Druid residents were, were at the, I guess that was pretty late, but were involved in that. I remember it was a, quite an uproar, and I just wondered, did they get involved in things like that? Oh, political causes, you mean? Well, or? environmental, more environmental causes, were they active? Were they, did they get involved in any way during, in the Marin Headlands controversy, and, and which was yeah. about that time, I think? Not to my knowledge. Mm -mm. Did, so my father was apolitical, other than the fact that he you know, believed that the government was a criminal organization. But he, he didn't try to do anything about it. Particularly. But we kind of skipped over one, one thing here, which is Margot St. James. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> David. There's Mar an Margo interesting story. Was quite, you know, was quite involved in you know almost anything that was happening politically in in Mill Valley, so San Francisco. So I think she would have had a, a, a few words about it, but I don't know in particular that um, event. What year did she show up at Druid Heights, Margot? And what year did she leave, approximately? Uh, huh? Well, she left in '74 when when I did. Okay, so yeah, she got, she was there when I came back first, the first time I came back from, actually when I graduated from high school. So she was there in 69, okay. yep. with living with Roger and then had been for some time before, but yeah. not okay. a lot. I think they that met on right. Vardis so at a party at, at, uh, at Allen's. Very, not, not, yeah, not Vardis, but Vardis well, was gone was by then, when he, when he lived there before, right? No, they lived no. there they at the were same still time. <coughs> oh, yeah, they were. They shared it. Yeah, oh, okay, so that, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they were, he, they were probably both. Still. So Margo, Margo and Alan showed up in Druid Heights kind of around the same time, then, it sounds like, I mean. I'm not sure of that timeline it, either. Yeah. I just know. 69, I've, I've 70. I've known all of Roger's partners. Over the years. Yeah. <laughs> who who, who were you asking about? Well, what time? Margo. What, well, Margo, when, what was her timeline at Druid Heights? Yeah. And then I was just thinking, well, when Alan moved up to Druid Heights was what, that late, right around the end of the 60s? I think he was right? there a little before Margo. Yeah, and then, and then, and yeah, so he was there like five years or so. Yeah. Okay. Ask my husband. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I've, I've met you, have I? Uh, me? No, me. Oh, you? No, I'm I don't sorry. think so, no. And you are? What's your name? David Wills. David Wills? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Nice to I meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I lived at Druid Heights for two years, I guess. Uh -huh. And then later on, I moved. I, I lived in San Francisco for 40 years. But for a while, I was living um, in Sausalito, and at one point somebody, and I don't know who it was, I think it was a woman, offered me the Vallejo boat that I could buy it for a dollar. Really? <laughs> and I, you I, didn't? I, I, um, it was pretty dilapidated, right? Yeah, it was very dilapidated, yeah. and it would take a lot of work to oh. look after it, so I didn't take anybody up on it, but I have no idea who it was who offered it I to I can't me. think of who, I, surrounded on, her name is on the tip of my tongue, who you? lived there later. Oh, yeah. Marion Salt. Marion, yes. Marion Salt. She wouldn't, but she wouldn't be offering it for sale. Yeah. <laughs> no. I told you. I wonder if it was a joke. You were listening. He didn't, didn't get the joke. It's possible. Yeah, it's that's possible. possible. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly gone through various owners and, yeah. you know, what are we I haven't been there in quite a while. Well, it's certainly <laughs> been fixed up fancy now. And, really? And, oh, yeah, that fellow, the, he's made a lot of money, Eric Gullickson. 
I believe uh, he made quite a bit of money in some, the er, like dot com, like 1990s, 2000, uh -huh. is my sense from just what I could find out about him, which wasn't much. And then he has it as a private artist's retreat by his invitation. You can never say, I'm an artist, can I come there? He finds you. And he um, went so far as to have the boat hauled out of Sausalito and hauled out of the water and the hull done. Wow. Whoa. wow. Which I have to believe costs one wow. heck of a lot of money. Yeah. Right. You know, and, I've, and if you can go to his website, it says um, the Valle it's the Vallejo Artist Retreat. Um, it is, and you can see pictures of what it looks like yes. inside now and everything. And Where's the boat? it's it right on the Bridgeway the there. It's yeah. just right on Bridgeway. It's oh. Gate it, five. Yeah, it's, it's pulled nice. right in. Yeah. yeah, it's pulled right in yeah. from the next to the road almost. Where did it used to be? Um, I don't know. Not, not much farther out. I think it's probably where it's always been. Is my sense was that it? was my sense. Yeah, it's where it's it was always on, been. It was on Gate Five Road yeah. in '74. Well, I lived there in '74. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just it's there, and you know, it's all painted. It's painted very dark colors, and um, and you know, I w I have to say, I was a little bit disappointed. So I I did get in touch with them and exchanged some correspondence. And they asked me where Druid Heights was and could they go there? And my standard answer is, no, I don't tell you that. And I don't encourage anyone to go there. The Park Service doesn't want that. So I'm not gonna tell you. But since you guys have this really strong connection to it, I will tell you. <laughs> you know? And they yeah. said, well, and we'll have no you over to, you we'll have you over on the Vallejo sometime. And I'm like, that's great. Well, I eventually called in that chip and it wasn't honored. Yeah. Mm. I thought that wasn't very nice. I yeah. went and, you know, for with one of your artists and you went out there and I told you the easiest way to walk from down below, minimal hiking and everything and, you know, and um, no. So <laughs> I've heard some interesting things about the guy who I've I've met him at the Sonoma Valley Museum of my, Art too. My He's quite a character. <laughs> my ex-girlfriend's brother lived in the ship for a while, and he, he told me that he he was kind of like being a predator to to young women. Uh, uh, uh -oh. The setup over there seemed a little bit like that, and it yeah. looked like most of his artists who like they came there were mostly all women, and mostly he's maybe not sixty like me, but not far away. And uh, that looked like most artists were, yeah, in their 20s. Women. So I was like, hmm, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he has preserved, I will say, from just a pure historic preservationist standpoint, he has preserved that boat very well. And that boat was built in 1879. That boat is pushing 100, that's a 150 year old boat. You know, or yeah, 150 year old boat now, or whatever. And it's like, wow. But it didn't look actually, anything like it did back in the day when it was so colorful. It's all painted like black and dark green. Yeah, it's like, it's like brown with it's, just a yellow window now. Yeah, it's very is uncolorful. It is mm -hmm. that over floating now? Uh, I don't know if it's floating I mean, or... The, the, the boat used to curve like that, the whole thing. I mean, the I whole think he, hole. he did a heck of a job on it, I hear. Yeah, so I mean, we're probably talking in the low millions to fix that yeah. thing. It used to like, be much more colorful. Oh, have you seen the, um, the have you seen the movie Uncle Yanko? No. Oh well, that was, you know, Agnes Varda, uh, Jean Yanko Varda's uh, quote unquote niece, really a cousin of sorts, French film director, came over to meet her American relative, and did a 20 minute film there in 1967, and it's in French with uh, you know so if you can't sub YouTube? sometimes it is and sometimes it yeah. isn't you know what i mean it right. gets put up it gets it torn was down showing this afternoon at the lark was oh, really wow. yes. oh, it was at the mill valley if, film if I hadn't festival been coming here i would have gone to wow <laughs> what, what was it called again? uncle uncle yanko y a n k o and agnes varda and it's really gives you a look inside the boat and and for 20 minutes and uh, there's also the really nice book about Varda, really nice book about really Varda, yeah. um, the, the, the Life and Art of Jean Varda. It's just a spectacular book. She did a superb job. And that was a huge labor of love. She that just book, died recently. 
Betsy did? Stroman died? No, Agnes Varda. Oh, Agnes, oh, yes. Oh, Agnes yes. Varda did. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to her. <laughs> just, a, oh. <laughs> just a little Sorry. while. I was yeah. Like, yeah, Betsy, Betsy Stroman, I, you know, she was very gracious. One of the first things I did with working me. with the Druid Heights, very nice. she asked me to come to the um, book passage store in Sausalito and spend five minutes in the midst of her talk, talking about, about her book, about Druid Heights relationship to it. We went out to dinner afterwards nice. and I learned about how, I said, so how much money are you making on that book? And she goes, how much money am I losing on that book? That yeah. book, right. she did all the, you know, wrote, did most of the material gathering and gathering materials, but she paid very high-end book people to put it together oh, yeah. for her. The book on Varda? Yes. Varda. Oh, it's gorgeous. Oh, it's, a gorgeous. it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful books. Yeah. And she never even met him. No, she never met him. Incredible what she did. Yeah, yeah, it's just, and, and nice things about Roger in there and their work yeah. together. And yeah. and uh, and actually, um, I, uh, uh, who did I talk to? I talked to, um, so Varda built a one house up in the Sonoma Valley. And I'm blanking on, he built it, oh, right. for, um, for um, uh, Walter and Joe Lander. Oh, did he? Yes, yeah. he built the Landers a house. It burned in 17. Oh, in the fire it burned no. i talked to oh, landor's really daughter so and it was this cool house it was built partly a lot of old doors that varda got at the salvage yards yeah. and he used them as siding and oh. went all the way around and it lasted till 2017 Are there and pictures of it um yeah they they have some i found a couple online and then there is one in the book in the Did varda book yeah, I'll try. Yeah. yeah. And I'll look in the Varda book. So she said, "Yeah, we're no, we haven't rebuilt, and we don't know what we're gonna do." And and well, she goes, "Yeah, Varda, bi she remembered <laughs> so building it." Things. And she goes, "Yeah, um, Jean Varda and his merry crew of you know workers." And I said, "You know, I think I'm." This book says that also Roger Summers. She goes, "I can't remember any of them now." And. Yeah. You know, maybe my sister does. I'll ask her if she right. does. I'll get back to you. But if you don't hear from me, it means no. We don't know. But yeah. anyway, there's several men. There's this little section in the book where it talks about parties and your dad playing music and down there and stuff. So, but it's just a great, great book. And a good read, too, actually, as well as all the incredible photos she collected. It really is. So. And she's incredibly gracious to researchers. Oh, really? Yes, oh, she's so nice to me. Great. Answered every question. So it's, it's a labor of love for her. You yeah. know, she's just fascinated by it. And I was so impressed. I mean, that's to me. People have asked me, Michael, do you want to do a book on Druid Heights? I said, no, that's not my thing. I would like to gather enough material for somebody else like that to come along mm -hmm. and do a book. If somebody could do a book of that caliber, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm always really anxious to find the photographs because that is what really, you have a book that's got a good story and it's it's, it's, you know, photos, though, make for just this yeah. thing that people can casually, you know, look at as well and enjoy. Yeah. So. I have a favorite photo that I took of my dad outside of the main house, Roger's house, um, playing the sax. Not that he could really play the sax, but he was <laughs> fooling around with it. And I love that picture. 